I move on to questions for the Minister for Employment and Learning. I call Ms. Katrina Ruan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And Kesht um, Iver Ahain, question number one. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, each further education college and each higher education institution, as public authorities, are required to have in place an equality scheme and to report to the Equality Commission on steps taken to promote equality of opportunity for categories listed in Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998. During 2013, I asked my officials to conduct an audit into how our colleges and universities were taking forward policies to combat homophobia. The results of this audit confirmed that all of our institutions engage in a range of positive practices in this area. In the FE sector, all colleges have in place a range of pastoral care arrangements aimed at promoting the health and well-being of students by promoting uh, them access to appropriate guidance and support, including personal safety and protection, anti-bullying, harassment, self-harm and suicide. Initiatives in place include the running of awareness and promotional events, the training of staff in combating bull bullying, the provision of support to lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender groups within college campuses, engaged with the Rainbow Project and working with college students' unions. In the higher education sector, institutions engage in a range of positive practices. All higher education institutions have anti-bullying policies and procedures in place which cover homophobic bullying. These policies and procedures continue to be monitored, reviewed and updated when necessary. Ms. Ruan for supplementary. And I'd like to I acknowledge the measures, I welcome them. However, students in colleges continue to experience homophobic, biphobic and transphobic bullying. And would the Minister agree that more needs to be done to ensure LGBT students feel safe while they study? And I'd appreciate what further measures the Department would be implementing. Well, obviously, the, the colleges and uh, universities are taking forward measures. Those are constantly reviewed, and indeed, we seek updates from the colleges to, to that end. But I have to say, I am stunned, shocked indeed, that the minister, or sorry, the member, given that she's a former education minister, is challenging what is happening in terms of the FE sector and the HE sector, where good practices in place. Because in the wider community, there's been demands over successive education ministers, including herself, to ensure that within our school setting, we have proper effective measures to deal with specifically homophobic bullying, not just bullying in general, but specific homophobic bullying. That has been a major gap in provision over the past number of years. And in that context, I'm somewhat surprised that the member challenging the good practice that's happening in the FE and HE sector compared to what's happening and hasn't happened in terms of our schools. Ms Sander Overend. Well, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Can, can the Minister outline what steps uh, he's taken in regard to sectarian intimidation in colleges as some, uh, some find that certain colleges are a cold house for unionists? Well, I have to say uh, to the member again, uh, our FE colleges and universities are, are very mindful uh, of the, the issue uh, of ensuring that we have a, a neutral environment in terms of how people uh, can, can learn together. And a neutral environment does not need to be some homogenised environment where people's expression of culture uh, is removed uh, fr from that situation. But clearly where there are complaints made in that regard, uh, whether it's the student unions or the, the authorities themselves in the, the, those bodies, they do need to take those type of comments extremely seriously. Call Mr John Dollard. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I feel the need to pay tribute to those people in colleges of further and higher education who have tackled this problem. Can I ask the Minister, is there anything that we can learn from their endeavours and indeed their successes which could be used in the wider battle against homophobia? Well, I thank the member for his comment and join with him in paying tribute to the leadership uh, across the third level education sector in terms of ensuring that we have a welcoming uh, environment. And I think the, the specific points I would make in response to his question uh, relate to how uh, colleges can, can um, engage with the commu wider community through, for example, uh, local policing and community safety structures, uh, how they can engage with the community and voluntary sector, and in particular the various uh, organisations uh, who will, will lobby and uh, campaign uh, and provide welfare issues in, in relation to different Section 75 categories, including, for example, within the LGBT uh, sector, uh, and how, in, in general, they can, they can uh, ensure that they have good, efficient practices in place that will robustly challenge in those situations uh, where there is a clear breach uh, of equality duties, including intimidation and bullying. 
article. Mr. John McAllister. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister, in his replies, quite rightly mentioned that importance both um, through the main education system and into to the FE sector. Would he care to comment the, what measures are in place both in colleges and through his department? What support is there for young people on government-supported work schemes to make sure they too are protected from any form of bullying, harassment, uh, including homophobic bullying? But the member makes a, a very valid point, uh, and indeed uh, to that end, as we have sought to design uh, our uh, different uh, apprenticeship uh, and youth training programmes, uh, look, looking, to, looking to the future, and also our provision under Pathways to Success in terms of our strategy for needs, we have been very mindful of ensuring that those involved in the provision of training are alert to, to the risks in terms of bullying, including uh, homophobic bullying, and also how to ensure that there is proper uh, partial support. And indeed, one of the key features, design features of the new youth training system, uh, which is just closing in terms of the public consultation, is around a much stronger focus around pastoral care than has been the case up until now. Mr. Alex Easton. Uh, question number two, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I wish to group questions two and ten and uh, to request an additional minute for the answer. Uh, bringing job fairs and information days into the heart of local communities has proven to be a very successful way of helping people into employment. In 2014, job fairs have been held in Belfast, Derry, Ballymoney, Newry, and recently in Craigavon. I'm pleased that feedback from employers, support organisations, and local clients has been encouraging. Those who attend can be interviewed for a job. Additional services are available on these days, such as online, online job search and participation in a job club workshop, where those who attend create their own CV. They also get tips and techniques about interviews. The department has also held a number of local community events where attendees have been offered full-time employment while others progressed into work placement opportunity. After the recent event in Kilcooley and Bangor, eight clients progressed into work, 45 were offered a work placement opportunity and three commenced the skills development programme. Importantly, following on from these events, many employers have requested my department's assistance with bespoke recruitment events, therefore providing further opportunities for local clients and communities. Job fairs are promoted actively to unemployed clients visiting local jobs and benefit offices and job centres. They are also advertised through local media, at press releases, social media sites, at my own department's website, Job Centre Online, and through sending leaflets to local community groups, libraries, colleges. My officials also take local geographical considerations into account and organise a community bus facility for, for rural areas if required to afford clients in these areas an opportunity to participate. In the lead-up to job fair event, events, my officials worked with, with clients locally to remove any barriers to attendance and to ensure every possible effort is made to allow clients to attend. This approach was successfully used during the recent job fair in Ballymoney, where community buses transported clients from Ballycastle and also the surrounding areas to Ballymoney. The same practice was used for last week's job fair in Craigavon, ensuring clients from Lurgan and Portadown and surrounding areas could participate. I am pleased there has been a steady rise in attendance at job fairs due to the measures put in place. Alex Easton for supplementary. Could I uh, thank the Minister for his answer? Um, would the Minister agree with me that the Kukuli uh, event was particularly very well attended, considering the, the bad weather, with over 100 young people going to it? And does the Minister feel that um, the actual partnership approach, not just between his department uh, and myself for setting it up, <laughs> but also in particular with the local community organisations and indeed the Bangor Chamber of Trade was maybe uh, the type of model that we want to uh, roll out right across Northern Ireland. First of all, for, for the benefit of the press release for the County Nine Spectator this week, yes, the member did a good job in terms of... Uh, <laughs> helping to organise the event, um, but can I say yes, it, it, um, it is something that is uh, very important in terms of the, the partnership between the community volunteer sector and the local business community. Um, these work most effectively when they are from the bottom up and responding uh, to, to local demand and uh, where we can see clear evidence that there, there is a critical mass of people who wish to take the opportunity, uh, both whether it's in terms of the community sector or the local businesses, as a department we're more than happy to facilitate that. Mr. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, could I first of all congratulate all the departments that were involved in the similar type of event this morning, which I left just about four hours ago in, in Limavady in County Londonderry. But uh, could I ask the Minister, as I did this morning, to some of the organisers of that event, what emphasis is put on the evaluation 
uh, post the events. This morning seemed to be exceptionally successful from the numbers I could see, but what lessons are learnt once the evaluations have been received from the event? to stress the importance of evaluation and constant uh, learning uh, as we go. And I am pleased to hear the, the very positive feedback uh, received uh, from Limavati. Um, by reference to uh, Craig Avon last Thursday, I think it was something like 1,700 people uh, through the doors, and those are, are considerable uh, numbers in that regard. I think we can uh, evaluate success through a number of different uh, outcomes. We want one, obviously, is those who are progressing into work or into further training uh, places, but also the feedback in terms of those attending in terms of whether they found the event yeah, useful and uh, that they, they were being uh, matched with people that were potential employers uh, f for, for their, uh, in terms of the, of the interest they had. And again, that feedback does tend to be very positive. Mr. Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And like all our members, there's no doubting the value, the contribution and the success of these fairs and the one on the Millennium Forum and Day last year. When we had literally hundreds of young people queuing for jobs, Minister, it is a success story. Is there any minister you could look at incentivising smaller businesses and medium-sized businesses to participate and contrib contribute to these fairs as well? Well, I think that the, the point I would say to Mr. Ramsey is very much how we can maybe look to do better in terms of uh, promotional work uh, with, with SMEs and making them aware of the, the opportunities. Um, I think it, it would actually be a much more efficient way at times for people to actually see the potential talent out there within communities than maybe some of the more traditional um, recruitment uh, techniques. It may be viewed in, in the short run as being a, a barrier um, or a, a, a something as an inconvenience uh, for businesses, but I think we have a message to communicate that actually this is a, something that's very much in the interest of businesses of all size, but in particular uh, SMEs. Berlin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Would, would the Minister acknowledge the, the role played by the local business education partnerships in this area, and particularly if I may say so, the Lisburn one, which is very active and had a careers convention just last week, which attracted over a thousand young people? Well, very much so. I, I uh, welcome uh, that uh, engagement and could also just say in that, in that regard, uh, recently I hosted a dinner between the, the incoming chief executives uh, of the, uh, the new super councils and the chief executives of our local um, FE colleges. And obviously our FE colleges have a very important role in terms of business support, particularly around uh, matching skills with the, the emerging needs uh, of the, the new council areas, which are obviously taking on additional powers in terms of economic development. So in terms of the informal structures at present and also what we can do more formally through the statutory agencies. Uh, I think there is a real desire to, to focus upon local solutions uh, for the, these problems and recognising that Northern Ireland is not necessarily one size fits all. And I was particularly pleased uh, that we had representatives from uh, the Lisburn and Castle Ray Council uh, who were very proactive in terms of seeking out new opportunities whenever we had that meeting. Mr Alistair Rowe. In September 2014, I provided the Employment and Learning Committee with an overview of the key policy proposals that have emerged from my department's consultation on a range of measures designed to improve the effectiveness of our current employment relations system. Following that engagement, I secured the Executive's agreement for the drafting of an employment bill that will give effect to the agreed policy proposals. These include a new process of early conciliation to be delivered by the Labour Relations Agency, the drafting of appropriate enabling provisions that would allow for a neutral assessment service to be established, the conversion from confirmatory to affirmative procedure of the Department's power to amend the qualifying period for the right to, to claim unfair dismissal, and adjustment from 90 to 45 days of the period of consultation in collective redundancy situations involving 100 or more employees. My Department has recently undertaken further policy reviews dealing with zero-hours contracts and the rules that govern the operation of employment tribunals. A paper on legislative proposals on regulating zero-hours contracts is being prepared for the Executive. It is intended that consultation on tribunal rules will be launched in early March 2015. It is my intention to secure Executive agreement to the, to the formal introduction of the Employment Bill to the Assembly before the summer recess. Well, Mr Ross for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister will know that um, in order to be a business-friendly environment, we want to have a highly skilled workforce if we can get the lower rate of corporation tax and a flexible labour laws. Is he confident, given the fact that in Great Britain they have moved further in terms of reform of employment law, particularly around the qualifying period for unfair dismissal, is he confident that after his employment law bill goes through this House that we will not be at a disadvantage when compared to other regions in the UK in terms of being attractive to investors and job creators? 
Well, well, first of all, it's important that we approach um, employment law with a perspective of, of balance. First of all, ensuring that we, we do meet the needs of business and give them sufficient flexibility, but also that we ensure we are giving uh, protection uh, to workers and also that our, our law in this regard does keep up to date, which is why we're looking at the issue of zero hours contracts, not to, in essence, rule them out, uh, but to ensure that there is adequate protection in an emerging area in terms of how we, we are dealing with, with, with the employees. It is important that we recognise that uh, employment law is devolved in Northern Ireland. We are the only part of the UK in which that is, is the case. It is important that we are competitive, but there are different ways in which we can ensure that we are uh, competitive. Uh, and in particular, I would highlight what we are trying to do about the uh, routing of claims uh, through the LRA and creating a much more holistic approach uh, based around uh, uh, the alternative dispute resolution techniques. I think will put us at a considerable advantage compared to, to, to many of our neighbours. Of course, with respect to unfair dismissal, that is a, a much much more controversial issue, and the member will well know that there, there isn't a, a, an agreed approach on that particular issue uh, within the, the structures of the Assembly. I call Mr. Danny Kenahan. Thank you very much, um, Deputy Speaker. I ask the Minister what he intends or what he intends to do within law to make it easier for small and medium businesses um, to take on additional employees, whilst at the same time not actually putting the businesses at risk at the same, same time. Well, already um, we have a situation where businesses can take on um, em employees, and we, we are seeing, for, ex for example, a, a change to a much more casual approach uh, to, to employment, which recognises how labour markets are evolving, and in many respects that is a, a natural uh, progression. But at the same time, it is important that, as government, uh, we keep up to date uh, with the changes in practice and ensure that our, our regulation is balanced and proportionate, uh, but that we also are mindful of the interests of employees and ensuring that they have uh, that their rights uh, are appropriately balanced and protected. Call Mr. Phil Flanagan. Um, can I ask the Minister, given his comments towards uh, the casualisation of, of labour and, and my concerns about the, the casualisation of um, workers' rights, um, what legislative proposals are contained um, within the executive paper that he's drafting around zero hour contracts, and specifically, um, how does his paper intend to, to further enhance and protect the rights of working people? Well, I suppose I should welcome the member back to uh, formal speaking rights um, in, in, in the chamber as such, though uh, he uh, would have picked up from the previous answers that we uh, did touch upon the issue of zero hours contracts. Um, we are currently finalising uh, proposals uh, within the department to take to, to the executive. Also, the, the, the committee is set to get a briefing on the issue uh, within the next, um, it's either this week or, or next week. Um, we are seeking to introduce some regulation in respect to zero hours contracts, particularly around uh, exclusivity, and also under what conditions people would have the right to request or indeed expect a, a different type of contractual uh, situation. I think for me the, the main issue around the casualisation is the uncertainty around pay and, and the, the knock-on effects that, some, that the, that has for someone around uh, planning family life and also access, whether it's the, the benefits or ability to secure mortgages and, and other such financial um, instruments. So there's a there's a, there's a big debate here. The intention would be that once we get executive approval, uh, over the, hopefully over the next uh, few weeks, that we will then go to the legislative draft uh, people to uh, get the clauses drafted, which will then be included uh, in the main employment bill, which will hopefully be introduced to the Assembly before the summer recess. Call Mr Tom Elliott. Uh, question number four, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, although the final budget for my department has somewhat improved since the draft budget, with £20 million being restored from the additional cuts proposed, the department still faces an unprecedented situation in terms of funding. This will impact across all areas of my department's work, including further education. I have tried to protect frontline services, but there is no doubt that the cuts will have implications for staffing in the colleges and also in terms of places in the colleges. Those are, however, matters for the colleges themselves. I met with the Employment and Learning Committee last week to praise them of my thinking on the budget cuts and I am currently in, in the process of finalising decisions. At present, I am proposing a £12 million reduction for, for the further education sector, which may be partially mitigated by the proposed use of £6 million in terms of end-year flexibility, subject to the agreement of the Executive. This is, in effect, the use of the reserves within the sector. Elliot, for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I, I thank the Minister for that update. Uh, and I, I, I acknowledge what he says about uh, the matter is up to the regional colleges how they decide their own budget. But could the minister give us some example of the potential uh, redundancies that that could create, for example, in the, the Southwest Regional College, 
uh, and will there be any compulsory redundancies involved in that? Well, with respect to, to the member, I, I am going to, have to need to be very careful about speculating in terms of places and also jobs in terms of what happens in, in, in individual colleges. Each will be in a somewhat different financial uh, situation and uh, the effect of the cuts will work out differently within each of those areas. Uh, Without doubt, we are still facing a, a very significant uh, situation. And I, th I think it is worth noting that this is perhaps the, the first time in certainly living memory uh, that we are about to rationalise access to further education, which has hitherto uh, been always open uh, to, to the public right across uh, the, the board. Um, within the sector as a whole, there is a, a coordinated approach to how the cuts can be, be managed, and I am pleased that across colleges and I, and also across the different uh, principals and chairs of the boards, there is a common understanding as to some of the different means by which the effect of the cuts may well be mitigated in a manner that reduces the impact in terms of the front line as best as possible. Mr. David Hilditch. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his, for his answer to date. Uh, we had learned recently at the committee that there is a chance to, to try and offset the college budgets. There is an equalising of uh, fees as such. Could you, because, because of the differential, could you tell us how that potentially could work? Well, at, at present, um, our higher education institutions are entitled to charge a, a fee uh, just short of £3,800. Obviously, our further education colleges are also providers of higher education. At present, we have uh, two out of the six colleges that charge uh, fees in the region of two and a half thousand, and four of the six uh, charge in the region of about one, one and a half thousand. So, with, across the sector, just building upon the point I made to Mr. Elliott, uh, there is a view that those fees should be standard in the, in the region of, of two and a half thousand, which is still significantly less uh, than the, 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 uh, the, 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 the tuition fee cost in terms of um, a, a higher education qualification at a university. So. Higher education within further education is still going to be a very attractive option, and in particular, as the foundation degree courses are designed with the needs of employers and the wider economy in mind, they are actually a very attractive and lucrative way of achieving third level uh, qualifications uh, that would actually stand someone in very good stead in terms of their future career. Call Mr. Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answers. Would the Minister agree that the cutback in some of these courses? Uh, and some of the further education colleges could have a damaging effect on the local economy, particularly in relation to enterprise training and the STEM subjects and in relation to some vocational or practical courses. What advice is the Department giving to governors of colleges to ensure that there is no uh, shortfall in relation to the provision that would affect employment going forward? Well, but I can't give any assurances in that regard because uh, whenever you're dealing with, with cuts, I mean, this will have a, a real impact in terms of uh, frontline provision. And as far as we can uh, mitigate those uh, impacts, we, we, we will seek to, to do so. But nonetheless, there will be an impact upon uh, the, the front line. We, you just can't avoid it in terms of the scale of cuts that we, we are making. And all of that will have an impact to some extent in terms of the, of the economy uh, in different parts of Northern Ireland and within our society as a whole. But there are some areas that we have uh, asked for uh, protection, and for example, what we're doing around apprenticeships and the new uh, youth training system will be protected. We've also asked both the universities and colleges to protect investment in terms of STEM subjects, given their very particular importance uh, to, to the economy. So there is a strategic, uh, strategic and planned approach being adopted to how we find the savings, uh, but nonetheless, it, it is a challenging situation. Call Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. I uh, want to thank the Minister uh, coming to the committee last week to especially brief us on the budget and know he's trying his best to mitigate the cuts. But I understand that the Belfast Metropolitan College is seeking to cut uh, ESO teaching quite drastically for them to meet the budget. Can I ask the Minister what impact this is going to have on the new uh, immigrant population? Well, ESO uh, and uh Access to that is something we do take uh, very uh, um we do, we do take very seriously. Um, what is happening in terms of Belfast Met is, is just a standardisation of, of the approach in terms of what's happening in the other five uh, colleges. Um, this will remain something that is uh, a feature of, of all of our colleges, and in particular, as we, we still continue to attract um, skills and uh, uh, people coming in from overseas to work, and 
to invest in our society, it is important that we do continue to provide them uh, with access to um, uh, ESOL type courses. Well, Mr. Duthie Mackay. Good. Question number five. Uh, along with, with uh, Minister Foster, I have been working pro uh, proactively with JTI Gallagher to discuss their plans and the needs of the workforce in an involving situation. Officials are exploring the use of the European Globalisation Adjustment Fund in these circumstances. This provides support to people losing their jobs as a result of major structural changes in world trade patterns due to globalisation, for example, when a, a large company shuts or production is moved outside the EU. The fund has strict eligibility criteria, and my officials are continuing to explore whether these would be met in this case. I plan to build on the work of my officials and include this in discussions when I am in Brussels later this month for meetings with the European Commission. The department has a portfolio of services available to assist at JTI Gallagher employees. The Career Service and Employment Service offer advice and guidance. This includes the Redundancy Advice Service in partnership with other organisations and it provides information and advice on available options and support. The Northern, Northern Regional College has liaised with JTI Gallagher on the help it can provide. In addition to its ongoing programme, which is open to all, the College is offering a tailored approach of conducting skills audits of the workforce. This would help individuals to obtain relevant qualifications, either through accrediting their experience or providing the, the, the training necessary to gain relevant skills and qualifications. Call Mr Mackay for a supplement. I thank the Minister for his answer, uh, and he made reference to uh, the Globalisation Fund. Could I, could I ask the Minister uh, what his assessment is, is at this moment in time uh, on the likelihood that we will qualify uh, for the Globalisation Fund and those funds will go, go towards those workers? Well, if he's asking me to be re realistic, I would say that our, our prospects are, 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 are narrow, but we, nonetheless we will uh, seek uh, to explore all of the options. It was interesting that whenever the announcement was made of the redundancies back uh, last year, I think virtually every party in some form or other rushed to the media to say the, the, uh, the European Globalisation Fund will, will be the answer to, to our problems uh, without necessarily checking through the, the issues. There are a couple of things that we have to, to bear in mind. One is that we have to uh, ensure that, um, that, that, that the, we actually qualify in terms of, of the jobs. And where we see a situation where jobs from Badamina are being relocated elsewhere within the European Union, that, that loss of jobs in Badamina would not count towards eligibility. It is through job losses outside the context of the European Union. But on the other hand, we can also include the supply chain. So we may just make that, that threshold. We then have to ensure that any bid we make is, is approved and processed by the Department of Work and Pensions in London, because as the member will appreciate, it has to be channeled through uh, the, the, the national mem member state, which is obvious, obviously, as the member knows, in our case, the UK. And um, to, to that end, the UK government has not previously supported any application to the fund. And then thirdly, we have to ensure that what we put in place in Northern Ireland is additional to our existing provision. And also, we have to ensure that we match fund the European Globalisation Fund from local resources or potentially from the company themselves. Robin Swan. Thank you very much. Uh, the Minister says the opportunity is narrow. What additional work is himself and the Enterprise and Trade and Investment Minister putting in to make sure that this becomes a reality? Um, well, we've had a number of discussions um, with the, the company and we have floated with them uh, the potential of them uh, making some contribution in the event uh, that a successful bid uh, could, could be made. We've had discussions with the Commission about how to best make an application. Uh, I intend to take those forward further uh, next week whenever I am uh, in Brussels. Um, we're not yet in a situation where we would be expected to make any application because we have to wait until the job losses become a reality, which is not going to be a case until May of 2016. But if we feel that we have a reasonable prospect of a successful application, we will seek to, to proceed on, on a shadow basis and to get a provisional indication to the likely success or otherwise of a bid so that we can process up very quickly uh, whenever the, the, uh, the, 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 the timing allows us to make a bid once the redundancies become a reality. Right. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, and can I ask the Minister, uh, putting aside the, the discussions around a bid uh, for the Globalisation Fund, what other discussions has the Minister have had with the company JTI uh, to ensure and in order that they would leave a lasting legacy in North Antrim and in particular Bellamina, uh, given that it would be called consolation, but none the least it would help the, the, the community and the people there? Well, can I, can I say, I mean, 
speaking for both Arnie and Foster and myself, I mean, we've had I mean, full um, cooperation uh, from the, the company. They uh, have been accessible to us, and they're also acutely aware of the impact of the loss of jobs in terms of the lives of individual workers themselves, their families, and the, the wider community. They are more than happy to facilitate us in terms of the work that we would do as a department and also other agencies and also the Northern Regional College in terms of skills audit and retraining. The key issue, and it is important that members bear this in mind, is the timing around when this would take place because production is still continuing in the factory and, if anything, it is actually going to increase as they work towards uh, the, the, uh, the, the timings around the, the change in, in, in directives. So um, it is important that what we do it does not interrupt the natural flow of business in the company, but at the same time we can move very quickly at the appropriate time to intervene, and we stand ready to go whenever the company deems it appropriate for us to do so. Order. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr Cathal O'Sheen. Uh, can, sure uh, can I ask the Minister, given his continuing crusade against St Mary's University College, how, do, how would he intend to protect the excellent work done by St Mary's in promoting Irish medium education uh, by cutting the premium formula funding? Well, let me be very clear at the outset. There is no crusade against St Mary's at University College, though at times if you listen to uh, comments coming from the college and other political parties, perhaps a crusade against me in terms of all of, all of this. But we have to recognise that we have a system at present which is not working and, and delivering. It is very much an artificial system where we are subsidising our teacher training system, whether it is through an artificial figure in terms of teachers to be trained, whether it is through the premia, whether it is through the expansion into non-ITE subjects. Uh, and we are doing more and more and more to prop up a system that is not on its own right sustainable. That is why it is important that we consider reform. In the context of reform, there is a range of different models that we can put in place that can ensure that we protect issues around ethos, and that includes how we can train teachers for the Irish medium sector. We have seen how reforms have been taking, taking place successfully in Glasgow, uh, and more recently uh, from September of this year in Dublin. Now, in the case of Dublin, we are seeing a, a Catholic institution uh, going back with a history longer than St Mary's, a Church of Ireland institution going back with a history longer than either. Uh, coming together with Dublin City University to create a, a new approach to, to teacher training within the, the, city of, the city of Dublin. That is happening with, with the support of the Catholic hierarchy. And issues around ethos can be accommodated within a shared and inclusive environment. That applies to both the Church of Ireland uh, ethos issues and also the Catholic Church issues in terms of, of the, uh, the future of the of, of training teachers of the Catholic maintain system. So that begs the question, if something can be done successfully in Glasgow and Dublin, why is, it, is Northern Ireland insisting on being so, so much different? I thank the Minister for his answer. Well, can the Minister give me an assurance that, contrary to what he has intimated, uh, should the Executive decide to reinstate the Premier for St Mary's answer and Mills, that he will stand over and indeed implement that decision? Well, the member well knows that I, I as a minister, am bound by the ministerial code. So, where a decision is taken, um, decisions by the executive's decisions will, will be respected. Now, that is not going to prevent me, however, in, ensuring that um, I continue to, to highlight the importance of the prioritisation of skills within our economy. It is not going to stop me from saying and continue to promote the importance of, of a shared future. And I have to say, whenever the member talks about the importance of protecting the, the, the Irish culture, I uh, took the opportunity to invite some of the protesters um, who were at Parliament Buildings a couple of weeks ago to talk to me about uh, teacher education and what was so important that they were trying to protect. And I was actually quite shocked by some of the things I heard. I mean, first of all, people were saying that they did, didn't feel safe um, celebrating their Irish culture outside the context of St Mary's. Now, in terms of what we hear, from, particularly from unionist benches over our universities, uh, and the, the perception, falsely in my view, about Gaelic culture in terms of universities, I find that an incredibly strange uh, and that narrow approach to be taken. I also heard people saying to me that they did not see the need to be engaging in sharing. They were quite happy, having gone to a Catholic primary school, Catholic secondary school, to go to a Catholic-based uh, third-level education system because they are going to go on and teach in a Catholic secondary school whenever, or Catholic primary school whenever they qualify. So why do they need to mix with anyone else in society? In the 21st century, whenever we are trying to build a shared future, I find those attitudes to be utterly shocking. Call Mr David Hildy. Principals, Deputy Speaker, and... Uh, could I ask the, the Minister to detail any effect any budgetary settlement will have on those in the NEEKS category? Well, 
very clearly um, that there are some major uh, challenges in relation uh, to uh, NEETS. Um, we were uh, lucky to have a very generous settlement from the executive in relation to our pathways uh, to uh, success uh, strategy for, for the 2012-2015 period. That funding package expires on the 31st of March. Now, to be fair, that was always the, the understanding. Had the situation been different, I would have hoped that that funding package uh, would have been renewed. Uh, that has not been the case. So we have lost that uh, money in the same way we have lost some of our jobs in an economy initiative uh, money. And then falls to us to see how we can best address uh, th those shortfalls. We are looking to see how we can, we can continue the Community Family Support Programme, and uh, I am optimistic that that will be, will be the case. We are also trying to see how some of the existing good practice can be replicated in terms of the forthcoming uh, European Social Fund uh, round, and uh, applications have gone in uh, on the basis of how they can engage with people who are disengaged from the, young people who are disengaged from the labour market. Indeed, that is one of the key f features of the, the current uh, ESF round, which itself is a bigger round than, than in previous years. So it is a very challenging situation, but nonetheless, the strategy stays in place, and we will continue to see how we can find alternative means uh, to deliver for that important group of young people. Mr. Hill, H for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I also thank the minister for his answer and acknowledge the challenges that he has ahead. Uh, there will be a knock-on effect uh, for the loss of places at the higher educational level, which will impact down through the colleges. How can that be protected, or can we give any protection to the vulnerable in our communities where the colleges do a lot of work and programmes? Yeah, well, it is important that the co our colleges do continue to outreach in, in the community, and there are some good examples of uh, students themselves uh, through the community and voluntary work uh, working in disadvantaged communities around uh, some of those issues, and indeed students can get credit in terms of, of uh, the new uh, uh, higher education achievement report that has been uh, rolled out within our higher education sector in terms of those non-curricular uh, act activities uh, that are so important towards employability skills. So it is a real benefit for students engaging in, the, in those type uh, of, of, of activities. But without doubt, we are facing a, a potential loss of, of provision, and there is no plan B uh, in terms of, of how we can mop up. I mean, if, if we had additional resources, we would actually do what we would like to do in terms of our existing plans. Call Mr. Chris Hazard. Can I ask the Minister to explain why a substantial number of applicant organisations to the European Social Fund were disallowed on the basis that they did not provide management accounts, despite having supplied audited accounts, as has always been the case to date? Well, it is important to bear in mind that we are we're currently going through a live uh, process. And uh, where groups uh, do wish to make an appeal, they, they, they can uh, do so. But I, I should say at, at this stage that the guidance notes that were sent out in relation to the ESF round were very clear on the need for both audited accounts and management accounts. And also people were advised to ensure that they provided all of the information uh, requested. So, but nonetheless, where a group wishes to, to challenge or appeal uh, any decision that has been taken in, in that regard, that they, they are free to do so. And indeed, a number of organisations are taking up that opportunity. Call Mr. Hazard for supplement. Thank you. Thank the Minister. And I'm not surprised that a number of organisations are taking up the, the, the opportunity to challenge. Indeed, it has brought to my attention that at least two organisations were contacted behind the scenes by your department and requested that they resubmit their financial documents. So, in an effort to redress that particular wrong and maybe to avoid court cases that will do nothing to address the financial crisis that many of these organisations now find themselves in, what steps will you be taking to redress this situation? But let me, be, let me be, be very clear. I mean, organisations can, can appeal, and we will listen to all the evidence that is provided. I am not part of that process, just to, to, be, to be very clear uh, as well. But equally, the member needs to be, to be aware, as to every other member, that we have to ensure that we have an objective standard by which we allocate the funds in relation to, to the European Social Fund. So where we, we find ourselves with situations where the, the, the guidance notes have, and rules have not been followed, if we are to bend those for, for particular organisations, that then has a knock-on effect in terms of the integrity of the process, and we end up with a situation where a group that would otherwise uh, be funded, who had followed the rules, would then have an even bigger potential claim against the department. Mr David McNary. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I must say I like the Minister's response to the first uh, topical question, and we will see how we go from here on. Will the Minister confirm how many of our regional further educational colleges have been in budgetary deficit situation in the past three years? Well, I, I can't give the, the member 
the complete uh, figures today. I will write to him in, in, in that uh, regard. Um, however, the, the situation in terms of the FE sector is one where the, the colleges have been facing declining financial support from government over the past seven, seven or eight years. Um, they have not had any meaningful in increases. At the same time, we have been asking them to do, to, to do a lot more. So they have been doing extremely well to, to maintain their level of activity on what is in effect a declining uh, resource uh, basis. And in terms of the particular accounts, uh, my department uh, does, uh, obviously, as the, uh, the, the sponsoring body for the colleges, keep a close eye in that regard. And while deficits may occur uh, from, from time to time, currently none of the colleges are, are, are causing us any concern in terms of their direct financial management. And as a member may, may know, in terms of the, uh, the recent past, there has been situations where some colleges have actually been in, in a very worrying situation. McNary for a supplement. Thank you. I uh, accept the Minister will forward the information to me, and I, I look forward to receiving that, and I do thank him for what he said there. But um, would he accept that part of the solution uh, is that the the, the big uh, college model with expensive big bureaucracies uh, should now be replaced by uh, small, lightly managed, responsive colleges with minimum bureaucracies. Well, I would was, I was say to the member, if, if anything, we're probably likely to go uh, in the opposite direction, given the, the, the real pressures that are there in terms of resources. One of the initiatives that we are seeking to take forward is the, the promotion of shared services across the six colleges uh, to try uh, to, to address any particular efficiencies that we can find in terms of provision. One thing I will say, however, that's, that's not on our, on our agenda is any rationalisation of the six down to five, four, three, etc. On the other side, we're not seeking to devolve things a, a, any further in, in, that, in that sense. We've actually come from a situation where there's been a larger number of colleges and the decision, quite rightly in my view, uh, to consolidate was taken uh, about, uh, te about 10 years ago or so. We could also be very clear as well that our colleges are incredibly responsive. They have changed uh, dramatically over the past number of years in terms of how they engage with their local business communities. They are increasingly seen as being the first point of contact in terms of businesses particularly SMEs looking for skills and also increasingly for research and innovation uh, solutions. Some of the things that we're doing in terms of how we manage the current budget uh, problems about addressing duplication between the department and colleges, we are resolving in favour of the colleges, trying to give them more power at a local level to engage with their local uh, business community about uh, trying to create local economic solutions. As Palm Cameron is not in their place, I call Mr Mike Nesbitt. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister for an update on the situation with regard to Emma Rogers, who is currently working in Australia? Um, I, I can't give, give the member a, a direct answer on that point uh, today, except I, and it's probably not appropriate to discuss an individual case on the floor of the Assembly, but I, I th I'm pretty certain that I've cleared a response that's come back to the member in that regard, and hopefully it, it has uh, been received and a positive solution has been, uh, has been obtained. Mr Nesbitt, for supplementary. I assure the Minister that uh, Ms Rogers has no difficulty with the case being, being raised. She's a resident of Perth, Australia, although a native of Northern Ireland. She's working in a childcare centre, uh, and she's uh, under threat of losing her job because although she's fully qualified, and the Minister has the information to that effect, through no fault of her own, she doesn't have the certificate because of an error by City and Guilds. Uh, and the Australian Children's Education and Care Quality Authority are saying she'll have to leave her job if she doesn't get that certificate. What is the Minister doing to ensure this person stays in employment? Well, from my uh, recollection, I think we have cleared a response to the member in that regard and that the issue has been satisfactorily re resolved. If the member wishes to come back, uh, if he feels that that is not the case, we're more than happy to entertain uh, further representations in, in, in that matter. But I think uh, the issue has now been resolved and hopefully the member has actually received a correspondence from the department uh, to that effect. Call Mr Adrian McQuillan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for an update on the new build for the Northern Regional College? Um, oh dear. Um, <laughs> which, which particular campus? Um, the, let, let me be very clear. <laughs> The, Nor the Northern Regional College is going to be a priority area in terms of capital investment, albeit we're in a declining uh, situation in terms of our, of our capital budgets. 
We are looking for a new build in the northern part of the, the catchment area and also a new build in the Balamina area. Um, we are still processing uh, the business case. One particular issue that we need to bottom out relates to uh, curriculum uh, design and ensuring that what we are putting in place uh, is meeting the needs of the future curri cur uh, curriculum. Um, but once that is, is, is in place, we will then clear the business case and look to secure the, the resources uh, to progress what are hopefully going to be two, two new builds uh, within the area. Order. Time is now up. That concludes question time. I invite members to take their ease uh, while we change the top table. Point of order.